Section four of the Wheels of Chance. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. The Wheels of Chance by H. G. Wells. Chapter nine. How Mr. Hoopdriver was haunted. As Mr. Hoopdriver rode swaggeringly along the Ripley Road, it came to him, with an unwarrantable sense of comfort, that he had seen the last of the young lady in grey. But the ill-concealed bladery of the machine, the present machinery of fate, the due machina, so to speak, was against him. The bicycle, torn from this attractive young woman, grew heavier and heavier, and continually more unsteady. It seemed a choice between stopping at Ripley, or dying in the flower of his days. He went into the unicorn, after propping his machine outside the door, and, as he cooled down and smoked his red herring cigarette, while the cold meat was getting ready, he saw from the window the young lady in grey and the other man in brown entering Ripley. They filled him with apprehension by looking at the house which sheltered him. But the sight of his bicycle, prompt in a drunk and incapable attitude against the doorway, humping its rackety mudguard and leering at them with its darkened lantern eye, drove them away, so it seemed to Mr. Hoopdriver, to the spacious swallow of the golden dragon. The young lady was riding very slowly, but the other man in brown had a bad puncture and was wheeling his machine. Mr. Hoopdriver noted his flaxen moustache, his aquiline nose, his rather bent shoulders, with a sudden, vivid dislike. The maid at the unicorn is naturally a pleasant girl, but she is jaded by the incessant incidents of cyclists, and Hoopdriver's mind, even as he conversed with her in that cultivated voice of his, of the weather, of the distance from London, and of the excellence of the Ripley Road, wandered to the incomparable freshness and brilliance of the young lady in grey. As he sat at meat he kept turning his head to the window to see what signs there were of that person but the face of the golden dragon displayed no appreciation of the delightful morsel it had swallowed. As an incidental consequence of this distraction, Mr. Hoopdriver was for a minute greatly inconvenienced by a mouthful of mustard. After he had called for his reckoning, he went, his courage being high with meat and mustard, to the door, intending to stand, with his legs wide apart and his hands deep in his pockets, and stare boldly across the road. But just then, the other man in brown appeared in the gateway of the Golden Dragon Yard. It is one of those delightful inns that date from the coaching days. Wheeling his punctured machine. He was taking it to Flambeau's, the repairs. He looked up and saw Hoopdriver, stared for a minute, and then scowled darkly. But Hoopdriver remained stoutly in the doorway until the other man in brown had disappeared into Flambeau's. Then he glanced momentarily at the Golden Dragon puckered his mouth into a whistle of unconcern, and proceeded to wheel his machine into the road until a sufficient margin for mounting was secured. Now, at that time, I say, Hoopdriver was rather desirous than not of seeing no more of the young lady in grey. The other man in brown, he guessed, was her brother, albeit that person was of a pallid fairness, differing essentially from her rich colouring, and, besides, he felt that he made a hopeless fool of himself." But the afternoon was against him, intolerably hot, especially on the top of his head, and the virtue had gone out of his legs to digest his cold meat, and altogether his ride to Guildford was exceedingly intermittent. At times he would walk, at times lounge by the wayside, and every public house, in spite of Briggs and a sentiment of economy, meant a lemonade and a dash of bitter. For that is the experience of all those who go on wheels, that drinking begets thirst, even more than thirst begets drinking, until at last the man who yields becomes a hell unto himself, a hell in which the fire dieth not, and the thirst is not quenched. Until a pennyworth of acrid green apples turn the current that threatened to carry him away. Ever and again, a cycle, or a party of cyclists, would go by, with glittering wheels and softly running chains, and on each occasion, to save his self-respect, Mr. Hoopdriver descended and feigned some trouble with his saddle, every time he descended with less trepidation. He did not reach Guildford until nearly four o'clock, 
and then he was so much exhausted that he decided to put up there for the night, at the Yellow Hammer Coffee Tavern. And after he had cooled the space and refreshed himself with tea and bread and butter and jam, the tea he drank noisily out of the saucer, he went out to loiter away the rest of the afternoon. Guildford is an altogether charming old town, famous, so he learnt from a guide-book, as the scene of Master Tupper's great historical novel of Stephen Langton. And it has a delightful castle, all set about with geraniums and brass plates commemorating the gentleman who put them up. And its guild hall is a Tudor building, very pleasant to see. And in the afternoon the shops are busy, and the people going to and fro make the pavements look bright and prosperous. It was nice to peep in the windows and see the heads of the men and girls in the draper's shops, busy as busy, serving away. The high street runs down at an angle of seventy degrees to the horizon, so it seemed to Mr. Hoopdriver, whose feeling for gradients was unnaturally exalted. And it brought his heart into his mouth to see a cyclist ride down it, like a fly crawling down a window-pane. The man hadn't even a break. He visited the castle early in the evening, and paid his twopence to ascend the keep. At the top, from the cage, he looked down over the clustering red roofs of the town, and the tower of the church, and then, going to the southern side, sat down and lit a red herring cigarette, and stared away south over the old, bramble-bearing, firm-beset ruin, at the waves of blue upland that rose, one behind another, across the wailed to the lazy altitudes of Hindhead and Buster. His pale gray eyes were full of complacency and pleasurable anticipation. Tomorrow he would go riding across that wide valley. He did not notice any one else had come up to the keep after him until he heard a soft voice behind him saying, Well, Miss Beaumont, here's the view. Something in the accent pointed to a jest in the name. It's a dear old town, Brother George answered another voice that sounded familiar enough, and, turning his head, Mr. Hoopdriver saw the other man in brown and the young lady in grey, with their backs toward him. She turned her smiling profile toward Hoopdriver. Only, you know, brothers don't call their sisters. She glanced over her shoulder and saw Hoopdriver. Damn, said the other man in brown, quite audibly, starting as he followed her glance. Mr. Hoopdriver, with a fine air of indifference, resumed the wield. "'Beautiful old town, isn't it?' said the other man in brown, after a quite perceptible pause. "'Isn't it?' said the young lady in grey. Another pause began. "'Can't get alone anywhere,' said the other man in brown, looking round. Then Mr. Hoopdriver perceived clearly that he was in the way, and decided to retreat. It was just his luck, of course, that he should stumble at the head of the steps and vanish with indignity. This was the third time that he'd seen him, and the fourth time her, and, of course, he was too big a fathead to raise his cap to her. He thought of that at the foot of the keep. Apparently they aimed at the south coast, just as he did. He'd get up betimes the next day and hurry off to avoid her, them, that is, it never occurred to Mr. Hoopdriver that Miss Beaumont and her brother might do exactly the same thing, and that evening, at least, the peculiarity of a brother calling his sister Miss Beaumont did not recur to him. He was much too preoccupied with an analysis of his own share of these encounters. He found it hard to be altogether satisfied about the figure he had cut, revise his memories as he would. Once more, quite unintentionally, he stumbled upon these two people. It was about seven o'clock. He stopped outside a linen draper's and peered over the goods in the window at the assistant's in torment. He could have spent a whole day happily at that. He told himself that he was trying to see how they dressed out the brass lines over their counters, in a purely professional spirit. But down at the very bottom of his heart he knew better. The customers were a secondary consideration, and it was only after the lapse of perhaps a minute that he perceived that among them was the young lady in grey. He turned away from the window at once, and saw the other man in brown standing at the edge of the pavement, and regarding him with a very curious expression of face. There came into Mr. Hoopdriver's head the curious problem whether he was to be regarded as a nuisance haunting these people, or whether they were to be regarded as a nuisance haunting him. 
he abandoned the solution at last in despair, quite unable to decide upon the course he should take at the next encounter, whether he should scowl savagely at the couple, or assume an attitude eloquent of apology and propitiation. CHAPTER X THE IMAGININGS OF MR. HOOPDRIVER'S HEART Mr. Hoopdriver was, in the days of this story, a poet, though he had never written a line of verse, or perhaps romancer will describe him better. Like I know not how many of those who do the fetching and carrying of life, a great number of them certainly, his real life was absolutely uninteresting, and if he had faced it as realistically as such people do in Mr. Gissing's novels, he would probably have come by way of drink to suicide in the course of a year. But that was just what he had the natural wisdom not to do. On the contrary, he was always decorating his existence with imaginative tags, hopes, and poses, deliberate and yet quite effectual self-deceptions. His experiences were mere material for a romantic superstructure. If some power had given Hoopdriver the gifty, Burns invoked, to see ourselves as others see us, he would probably have given it away to someone else at the very earliest opportunity. His entire life, you must understand, was not a continuous romance, but a series of short stories linked only by the general resemblance of their hero, a brown-haired young fellow commonly, with blue eyes and a fair moustache, graceful rather than strong, sharp and resolute rather than clever. C.P., as the scientific books say, page 2. Invariably this person possessed an iron will. The stories fluctuated indefinitely. The smoking of a cigarette converted Hoopdriver's hero into something entirely worldly, subtly rakish, with a humorous twinkle in the eye and some gallant sinning in the background. You should have seen Mr. Hoopdriver promenading the brilliant gardens at Earl's Court on an early closing night. His meaning glances. I dare not give the meaning. Such an influence as the eloquence of a revivalist preacher would suffice to divert the story into absolutely different channels, make him a white-soured hero, a man still pure, walking untainted and brave and helpful through miry ways, the appearance of some daintily gloved, frock-coated gentleman, with buttonhole and eyeglasses complete, gallantly attendant in the rear of customers, served again to start visions of a simplicity essentially Cromwell-like, of sturdy plainness, of a strong, silent man going righteously through the world. This day there had predominated a fine, leisurely person, immaculately clothed, and riding on an unexceptional machine, a mysterious person, quite unostentatious, but with accidental self-revelation of something over the common, even a Blumenduk, it might be incognito, on the tour of the south coast. You must not think that there was any telling of these stories of this lifelong series by Mr. Hoopdriver. He never dreamt that they were known to a soul. If it were not for the trouble, I would, I think, go back and rewrite this section from the beginning, expunging the statement that Hoopdriver was a poet and a romancer, and saying instead that he was a playwright and acted his own plays. He was not only the sole performer, but the entire audience, and the entertainment kept him almost continuously happy. Yet even that playwright comparison scarcely expresses all the facts of the case. After all, very many of his dreams never got acted at all, possibly, indeed, most of them, the dreams of a solitary walk, for instance, or of a tram-car ride, the dreams dreamt behind the counter while trade was slack, and mechanical foldings and rollings occupied his muscles. Most of them were little dramatic situations, crucial dialogues, the return of Mr. Hoopdriver to his native village, for instance, in a well-cut holiday suit and natty gloves the unheard asides of the rival neighbors, the delight of the old matter, the intelligence, a ten-pound rise all at once from Antrobus matter, what do you think of that? Or again, the first whispering of love, dainty and witty and tender, to the girl he served a few days ago with Satine, or a gallant rescue, of generalized beauty and distress, from truculent insult or ravenous dog. So many people do this, and you never suspect it. You see a tattered lad selling matches in the street, and you think there is nothing between him and the bleakness of immensity, between him and utter abasement, but a few tattered rags and a feeble musculature. And all unseen by you, a host of heaven, sent fatuities, swathed about him, even, maybe, as they swathe you about, 
Many men have never seen their own profiles or the backs of their heads, and for the back of your own mind no mirror has been invented. They swathe him about so thickly that the pricks of fate scarce penetrate to him, or become but a pleasant titillation. And so, indeed, it is with all of us who go on living. Self-deception is the anesthetic of life, while God is carving out our beings. But to return from this general vivisection to Mr. Hoopdriver's imaginings. You see now how external our view has been. We have had but the slightest transitory glimpses of the drama within, of how the things looked in the magic mirror of Mr. Hoopdriver's mind. On the road to Guildford, and during his encounters with his haunting fellow cyclists, the drama had presented chiefly the quiet gentleman to whom we have alluded. But at Guildford, under more varied stimuli, he burgeoned out more variously. There was the house-agent's window, for instance, set him upon a charming little comedy. He would go in, make inquiries about that thirty-pound house, get the key, possibly, and go over it. The thing would stimulate the clerk's curiosity immensely. He searched his mind for a reason for this proceeding, and discovered that he was a dynamiteer needing privacy. Upon that theory he procured the key, explored the house carefully, said darkly that it might suit his special needs, but that there were others to consult. The clerk, however, did not understand the illusion, and merely pitied him as one who had married young and paired himself to a stronger mind than his own. This proceeding, in some occult way, led to the purchase of a notebook and pencil, and that started the conception of an artist taking notes. That was a little game Mr. Hoopdriver had, in congenial company, played in his still younger days, to the infinite annoyance of quite a number of respectable excursionists at Hastings. In early days Mr. Hoopdriver had been, as his mother proudly boasted, a bit of a drawer. But a conscientious and normally stupid schoolmaster perceived the insipid talent, and had nipped it in the bud by a series of lessons in art. However, our principal character figured about quite happily in old corners of Guildford, and once the other man in brown, looking out of the bay window of the Earl of Kent, saw him standing in a corner by a gateway, notebook in hand, busily sketching the Earl's imposing features, at which sight the other man in brown started back from the centre of the window, so as to be hidden from him, and, crouching slightly, watched him intently through the interstices in the lace curtains. CHAPTER Eleven, OMISSIONS now the rest of the acts of Mr. Hoopdriver in Guildford, on the great opening day of his holidays, are not to be detailed here. How he wandered about the old town in the dusk, and up to the hog's back to see the little lamps below, and the little stars above come out one after another. How he returned through the yellow-lit streets to the Yellow Hammer Coffee Tavern, and supped bravely in the commercial room, a man among men how he joined in the talk about flying machines and the possibilities of electricity, witnessing that flying machines were dead certain to come, and that electricity was wonderful, wonderful. How he went and watched the billiard playing, and said, left em, several times with an oracular air, and how he felt a yawning, and how he got out his cycling map and studied it intently, are things that find no mention here nor will I enlarge upon his going into the writing-room, and marking the road from London to Guildford with a fine, bright line, in the reddest of red ink. In his little cyclist's handbook there is a diary, and in the diary there is an entry of these things. It is there to this day, and I cannot do better than reproduce it here, to witness that this book is indeed a true one, and no lying fable written to while away an hour. At last he fell a-yawning so much, that very reluctantly indeed he set about finishing this great and splendid day. Alas, that all days must end at last. He got his candle in the hall from a friendly waiting-maid, and passed upward, whither a modest novelist, who writes for the family circle, dare not follow. Yet I may tell you that he knelt down at his bedside, happy and drowsy, and said, Our father chart in heaven, even as he had learnt it by rote from his mother nearly twenty years ago and anon, when his breathing had come deep and regular, we may creep into his bedroom and catch him at his dreams. He is lying upon his left side, with his arm under the pillow. It is dark, and he is hidden, but if you could have seen his face, sleeping there in the darkness, I think you would have perceived, in spite of the treasured, thin, straggling moustache, in spite of your memory of the coarse words he had used that day, 
that the man before you was, after all, only a little child asleep. Chapter 12 The Dreams of Mr. Hoopdriver In spite of the drawn blinds and the darkness, you have just seen Mr. Hoopdriver's face peaceful in its beauty sleep in the little, plain bedroom at the very top of the Yellow Hammer Coffee Tavern at Guildford. That was before midnight. As the night progressed, he was disturbed by dreams. After your first day of cycling, one dream is inevitable. A memory of motion lingers in the muscles of your legs, and round and round they seem to go. You ride through dreamland on wonderful dream bicycles that change and grow. You ride down steeples, and staircases, and over precipice. You hover in horrible suspense over inhabited towns, vainly seeking for a break your hand cannot find, to save you from a headlong fall. You plunge into weltering rivers and rush helplessly at monstrous obstacles. Anon Mr. Hoopdriver found himself riding out of the darkness of non-existence, pedaling Ezekiel's wheels across the weld of Surrey jolting over the hills and smashing villages in his course, while the other man in brown cursed and swore at him, and shouted to stop his career. There was the Putney Heathkeeper, too, and the man in drab raging at him. He felt an awful fool. A, uh, what is it? A juggins, a, a juggernaut. The villages went off one after another with a soft, squashing noise. He did not see the young lady in grey, but he knew that she was looking at his back. He dared not look around. Where the devil was the break? It must have fallen off. And the bell? Right in front of him was Guildford. He tried to shout and warn the town to get out of the way, but his voice was gone as well. Nearer, nearer! It was fearful, and in another moment the houses were cracking like nuts, and the blood of the inhabitants squirting this way and that. The streets were black with people running, Right under his wheels he saw the young lady in grey. A feeling of horror came upon Mr. Hoopdriver. He flung himself sideways to descend, forgetting how high he was, and forthwith he began falling, falling, falling. He woke up, and turned over, saw the new moon in the window, wondered a little, and went to sleep again. This second dream went back into the first somehow, and the other man in brown came threatening and shouting toward him. He grew uglier and uglier as he approached, and his expression was intolerably evil. He came and looked close into Mr. Hoopdriver's eyes, and then receded to an incredible distance. His face seemed to be luminous. "'Miss Beaumont,' he said, and splashed up a spray of suspicion. Someone began letting off fireworks, chiefly Catherine wheels, down the slope, though Mr. Hoopdriver knew it was against the rules." for it seemed that the place they were in was a vast shop, and then Mr. Hoopdriver perceived that the other man in brown was the shop-walker, differing from most shop-walkers in the fact that he was lit from within, as a Chinese lantern might be, and the customer Mr. Hoopdriver was going to serve was the young lady in grey. Curious, he hadn't noticed it before. She was in grey, as usual, rationals, and she had her bicycle leaning against the counter, she smiled quite frankly at him, just as she had done when she had apologized for stopping him, and her form, as she leant toward him, was full of a sinuous grace that he had never noticed before. "'What can I have the pleasure?' said Mr. Hoopdriver at once, and she said, "'The Ripley Road.' So he got out the Ripley Road and unrolled it, and showed it to her, and she said that would do very nicely, and kept on looking at him and smiling and he began measuring off eight miles by means of the yard measure on the counter, eight miles being a dress length, a rational dress length, that is. And then the other man in brown came up and wanted to interfere, and said Mr. Hoopdriver was a cad, besides measuring it off too slowly. As Mr. Hoopdriver began to measure faster, the other man in brown said that the young lady in grey had been there long enough, and that he was her brother, or else she would not have been travelling with him, and he suddenly whipped his arm around her waist and made off with her. It occurred to Mr. Hoopdriver, even at the moment, that this was scarcely brotherly behavior. Of course it wasn't. The sight of the other man gripping her so familiarly enraged him frightfully. He leapt over the counter forthwith and gave chase. They ran round the shop, and up an iron staircase into the keep, 
and so out upon the Ripley Road. For some time they kept dodging in and out of a wayside hotel with two front doors and an inn-yard. The other man could not run very fast because he had hold of the young lady in grey, but Mr. Hoopdriver was hampered by the absurd behaviour of his legs. They would not stretch out, they would keep going round and round as if they were on the treadles of a wheel, so that he made the smallest steps conceivable. This dream came to no crisis. The chase seemed to last an interminable time, and all kinds of people, heath-keepers, shopmen, policemen, the old man in the keep, the angry man in drab, the barmaid of the unicorn, men with flying machines, people playing billiards in the doorways, silly headless figures, stupid cocks and hens, encumbered with parcels and umbrellas and waterproofs, people carrying bedroom candles and such like riffraff, kept getting in his way and annoying him, although he sounded his electric bell and said, "'Wonderful! Wonderful!' at every corner." End of section 4